Hello again. I've noticed that some of those who comment on this channel refer to the Rothschilds and their supposed influence on world history. Also the idea that the Jews are taking over the world and encouraging immigration from Africa, together with a general feeling of superiority of Anglo-Saxons over and above other ethnicities. These ideas are often dismissed as being neo-Nazi, as though they were tied in in some way with Germany. This is quite untrue. They are all as English as crumpets for tea and cricket on the village green. On the 9th of September 1855, a baby boy was born in the quiet little seaside town of Southsea on the south coast of England. Britain was approaching the height of her imperial power in the world. Less than a year earlier, the Charge of the Light Brigade had taken place uh, in the Crimean Peninsula during the Crimean War in which Florence Nightingale was involved, of course. The child's father was an admiral in the Royal Navy and the prognosis was promising for the newborn baby that he would take a traditional path to respectability and success in Victorian Britain. As it happened, the baby, who was named Houston Stuart Chamberlain, was destined to inspire both the most dreadful war and also the worst genocide the world had ever seen. This would in turn end by tainting forever the idea of scientific racism and causing those who thought that there might be something in the idea of inherited traits of intelligence and character among varying ethnicities to be viewed as dangerous right-wing fanatics, men and women who are either foolish and misguided or downright wicked. <coughs> Houston Stuart Chamberlain was a sickly child whose mother died when he was just a year old. Because of this, he was raised by his grandmother and spent most of his childhood in France. His poor health led to his spending winters in the warmer climate of Italy and Spain. This lifestyle prevented the young boy from forming yet close friendships and he became a solitary and thoughtful child. Although his father hoped that Chamberlain would embark upon a military career, or failing that, take up a post in the colonial service, his son had other ideas and ended up studying science at the University of Geneva. It was here that he became fascinated with the idea of scientific racism. Of course, this was not at that time a subject which was regarded with as much distaste as it is now. Chamberlain became enamoured of all things German, learning the language well enough to write a massive academic book in German. His second marriage was to Richard Wagner's daughter. After working as a journalist and becoming well known for his views on race, Chamberlain settled in Austria where he held a post at the University of Vienna teaching philosophy. He was commissioned in 1896 to write a book explaining the supposed racial history of the world and the developments leading to the Industrial Revolution and the modern world. In 1899, this great work was published. It was written in German and not published until a decade later in English under the title of The Foundations of the 19th Century. It was a massive undertaking and attempted to show that the story of the rise of civilization was inextricably tied in with what he described as the Aryan race. He used the term Aryan interchangeably with Indo-European and it essentially meant white Europeans from the north of the continent. Russians were excluded from the Aryan race because they had mingled too freely in the past with Asians. To use Chamberlain's own words, they had become a mongrel race. According to Chamberlain, the history of the world was a struggle between different races. His ideas of race were very precise and exceedingly detailed. He distinguished, uh, for example, the Jews from the Arabs, the Hittites, he called Homo Syriacus, and viewed as the original Semites. Then too, there were the Bedouin Arabs, Homo Arabicus. Unfortunately, these two races had bred a new species, which Chamberlain referred to as Homo Judaicus. These were the Jews, and although a mongrel race, they possessed certain traits which allowed them to thrive at the expense of other races. 
It was the Aryans who had been responsible for civilization in Europe, but they were held back by the influence of the Jews. One way in which the Jews cast a baleful spell upon the Aryans was by means of Christianity. It will probably not escape notice here. Um, let me read a brief passage from Chamberlain. Da, 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 da. He talks of the ebb and flow of Jewish influence. Da, da, da. All the wars of the 19th century are peculiarly connected with Jewish financial operations, from Napoleon's Russian campaign to Nathan Rothschild's role of spectator at the Battle of Waterloo. He thought that the Rothschilds were at the back of wars in general and the affairs in Europe in particular. This is an idea still commonly found today in anti-Semitic conspiracy theories circulating on the internet, of course. The main theme of the foundations of the 19th century was an apocalyptic vision of the battle between Aryan uh, culture and Jewish cunning. The Aryans had produced everything worthwhile in science and art, while the Jews were capable only of mercantile manipulations and accumulating money. They planned secretly to destroy the Aryans both by tr promoting wars between them and also by miscegenation, uh, otherwise known as breeding between different races. Chamberlain, um, he attributed the fall of the Roman Empire to the Jews and thought it had been accomplished in part by the Jews encouraging Romans to marry into other and inferior races. He thought that 19th century Europe was going the same way. The effect of Chamberlain's work in Germany was immense. Kaiser Wilhelm was a huge fan of the foundation of the 19th century and used to read it to his children. He had copies sent to every library in Germany. Before Chamberlain's ideas became current, there was still a general belief that Jews could become Christians, that they could change their nature and be ordinary members of society like everybody else. Chamberlain was adamant that this was not so. It could never be. A Jew could no more become a member of the Aryan people than a black man could become white. Houston Stewart Chamberlain declined in the early years of the 20th century until he was either confined to bed or needed a wheelchair to move about. At the outbreak of war in 1914, he was living in Vienna and volunteered for the German army that was turned down on account of his age and infirmity. Chamberlain had a vision of a Wagnerian set-piece Battle of Ragnarok in which the forces of good, represented by the Teutonic Knights of Germany, fought against the crafty Jews who were determined to bring down Aryan civilization in Europe. These mystical ideas were combined in the foundations of the, 20th, of the 19th century with more practical suggestions. He thought that democracy was a Jewish invention and that the ideal government for an Aryan nation would be a dictatorship. This was just what a young Austrian who felt much the same as Chamberlain about the Jews wanted to hear after the First World War. Adolf Hitler was already violently anti-Semitic when he met Chamberlain for the first time in 1923. For both men the meeting was pivotal and it was also to prove pivotal for the future of the Jews in Europe. After meeting Chamberlain uh, Hitler and he had some correspondence and Hitler wrote saying that with one stroke you have transformed the state of my soul that Germany in her hour of greatest need brings forth a Hitler that is proof of her vitality this is what Chamberlain wrote to Hitler and Hitler wrote back uh, in similar fulsome terms praising Chamberlain they were very enamoured of each other Hitler, for his part, wrote that he would, to Chamberlain that um, he had inspired him and given him a blueprint for his future. The fatal meeting between one man who had promoted the idea of the Jews as a distinct racial group and another who had the strength of character to act upon what might in other circumstances have remained ramblings of a misdirected and obsessive intellectual 
was to have the most catastrophic consequences, not only for the Jews, but also for the millions of other people who became caught up in the Second World War. On Chamberlain's 70th birthday, Nazi newspaper Volkische Beobachter devoted five columns to praising him and describing the foundations of the 19th century as the gospel of the National Socialist Movement. Every aspect of the peculiar book was taken as an essential blueprint for the future of Europe, as Hitler and those who thought like him envisioned it. In the first half of the 20th century, um, some of these ideas were wide, had widespread support, elements of eugenics. They were widely um, adopted in parts of Europe and the United States. It's a very unfortunate thing that it should be an Englishman's ideas on all this, which should lead to the Holocaust and there was another um, bad point about it, in that it brought the whole notion of scientific racism into disrepute, um, from which it is not yet recovered. I'll have more to say about this in another video in the future.